This episode of the Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is The Citadel Cafe, episode number 486 for Wednesday, November 13th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and The Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we're into, and we've been doing it for 13 years. So happy anniversary to us, I guess. Uh, Technically, the, the anniversary is on the 17th, but this is the 13th and the closest Wednesday to the 17th, and I could not resist the opportunity to record the 13 year anniversary on the 13th. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> on to another 13, I guess. I, who knows, right? The voice that you're hearing chuckling in the background is, of course, my friend Stephen, who is back on this episode to talk with me about Arcane Season 2, Act 1. That will be coming mm-hmm. a little bit later. Spoilers ahead, just FYI, people. We're going to give you lots of notice that we're going to be talking about this show in detail. But if you're new to the Citadel Cafe, this is a podcast about sci fi and fantasy entertainment. It's available on all of the podcasting platforms, including YouTube. So if you're enjoying the show, give us a like wherever you're listening to this. Uh, those little things that are free really do help us reach a lot of new listeners. So I hope you are enjoying it and hopefully we'll see you again. In the meantime, we are going to talk about what we've been up to in our nerdy worlds. Stephen, what's been new with you? Well, for me, it's been busy, busy life, actually. I've gotten to the point in my life where my sons are both old enough to be off to college, which is just blows my mind when I say that out loud. So that kept us pretty busy for a while. And then and I, I guess the, on the nerdy side, it's just not been much. I've been applying for a new job that takes up more more mental bandwidth than I expected it to. And it's a sort of a long drawn out process. But yeah, it's been probably a month and a half of process right now and hopefully wrap it up in the next two weeks. But what, a month and a half already and another two. Yeah. So two like two months, like eight weeks of application process. That's wild. Yeah, it's it's kind of a four part process where it's the initial application, but it's the application you have to basically you can't just say that I have this experience. You had to illustrate those experience through paragraphs of text with dates, you know, month and year. It it was uh, mm-hmm. it was far more time consuming than expected. Then there was a portfolio. Then there were exam questions, and then the next, if I pass the exam questions, it's going to be on to an interview. So. All the fingers and toes crossed. I will keep those crossed for you as well. And that's the kind of thing that takes up a lot of mind share. Mm -hmm. I remember the last time that I was doing anything that involved learning. Without getting into the details, I would say it's probably that when when you and I last shared (laughs) job experience, uh, I feel like that was an intense learning for like probably the first three months. And I was just exhausted. Like I just, that amount of just constantly trying to learn the new skills, learn the new way things are done. But then also you and I have this bone uh, in common as well, wanting to do things well and wanting to do things correctly, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that motivation, which is a healthy one, also means that you are approaching things very seriously. And then I'll, you know, as a result, end up being extra tired <laughs> you know, because of yeah. um, the extra effort that you, you know, you and I would put into those kind of opportunities. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, I hope things that I hope things turn out very well on, on your side of, of the favor. Been busy myself, actually speaking about being a little bit tired. I spent the weekend moderating comic artist panels at Halcon 2024, which is, yeah, it's the annual sci-fi and fantasy convention for people that don't know. And it is the largest sci-fi and fantasy convention in Atlantic Canada. I think the next biggest convention in the country is probably Montreal Comic Con. I could be wrong on that, but I it's it's big and it's big in this region. Uh, so it happens every fall. Usually it's around Halloween ish, and this year it was on the long weekend. And so I had the pleasure of talking with artists like Shannon Waters of Lumberjanes, Stephanie Cook of Para Northern and Oh My Gods, Brianna June, a cover artist for Archie and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, also a local animator. 
Dax Gordeen, who I actually interviewed way back in 2016 on Comics Coast to Coast. Uh, he works on <laughs> projects like Giant Size Little Marvel and Forest Folk, his own webcomic. Ramon Perez of The Amazing Spider-Man, Flash, Kukuburi, and too many other award-winning comic adventures <laughs> to count. Uh, and Gavin Guidry of Birds of Prey and Superman 78. And everyone was delightful. They were wonderful to talk to. They had all kinds of interesting stories. Uh, I had the opportunity to do one-on-ones with Shannon, Stephanie, and Brianna uh, in like these little like a conversation with panels where it's just myself and the artist and then a group of people obviously that were there to hear them speak. And so that was really cool. And to have my previous experience in comics and on comics coast to coast and doing my own work as well alongside of podcasting experience made the the moderation I guess experience and conversations really really fun to do because i didn't feel overly out of my league like i kind of felt like yeah. even though i wasn't super familiar with everyone's work with the exception of dax and ramon um i figured i would be able to kind of get in there and, and talk to everyone and because of that um having some new people in there i also had to do a lot of preparation last week so like i missed a couple streams and so there was a bunch of stuff that kind of went into all of this but overall, I think it was a pretty successful weekend. And uh, I had a couple of nice compliments from just complete strangers at Halcon saying that they really enjoyed the panel, you know, that I, I moderated. Uh, I had compliments from um, Shannon and Stephanie saying that they really enjoyed the fact that I was moderating for them. So that was really nice. The way that they scheduled the weekend, I ended up moderating these six or seven artists all weekend. So like I didn't, I didn't have somebody new every day. Okay. It was basically the same sort of like over the course of like six to 10 panels that I was moderating. It was the same people just in different combinations with different topics. You know, like one was about licensing and creator owned works. The other one was about folklore. The other one was about like those one-on-ones that I mentioned. Um, so all that kind of stuff was really cool to kind of go, go back and forth with them. And after you do one panel with someone, you kind of learn their talking points, you know, kind of like what their experiences is like. And then that, that greater informs your next panel with them so that, you know, what kind of backup questions that you could have in case the audience is a little bit shy, which they were, <laughs> which I mean, on one hand doesn't surprise you because it's like a giant nerd convention. So like not everybody is quite ready to raise their hand in a group of 50 people to ask a question. Right. But at the same time, like, you've paid to go to this convention, you're sitting there face to face with an artist that you admire and are sitting there to listen to in a panel, like ask the question. Like that's the artists want nothing more than to stop talking of their own kind of like tales and <laughs> spins and answer a direct question. Because as the people are up there talking and we talked about this when the mics were off too, it's like, as you're up there spinning your stories, like you kind of really hope you're hitting on the points that people want to hear, but nothing is easier than actually hearing what points the people want to hear, you know, from the audience. Right, right. So, uh, so that was really interesting as well. Um, but I just, I have not been to Calcon since before the pandemic. So All right. It was uh, different to be around that many people again. And uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it's still a really nice space. The Halifax Trade and Convention Center, the new one is very large and you don't feel claustrophobic. In the older venues that they used to have this convention and you did feel pretty shoulder to shoulder with people, but this is, it's much more spread out. There's multiple floors. You, you really don't feel like you're crammed. The rooms are big uh, and very well laid out. Uh, there's lots of distance between even the first row of people in the audience and the people that are up on stage. So. That was, uh, that was good. Um, I did notice though, walking around the vendor floor, it's very homogenized now. There's in what way I've never been. Yeah. There's a lot of anime and oh, yeah. a lot of very similar anime. Like there always has been, you know, like there always has been anime and there's a certain style that you'll come to recognize. Like I used to be able to walk down an aisle in older Halcon, I guess, dates in like the late teens and in, in the 2000s and kind of figure figure out which studio they worked for here locally like i could see like oh oh you mean the art, the artwork yeah the artwork like look look at look at the artwork and be just like i think i know roughly what studio you work at or certainly who you hang out with you know in terms of the, right. the styles and stuff but this time around it was not just very homogenized it was very commercially homogenized there was a lot mm. of very pale blue very pale pink or a lot of gold and steampunky vibes, like a lot of silhouettes, a lot of dark stuff. Right. But it, all it was was like pink and blue versions of your favorite comic characters 
or steampunky versions of your favorite comic characters. And it didn't really feel like there's a lot of people doing original stuff. And I'm not poo-pooing fan art. It's an important part of the process. I mean, I did it. You know, you saw it should be Deadpool or it should be Spider-Man. And that's what brought you over to my table. But when you got there, I put one of my original books in your hand and said, here, flip through this while you're browsing, you know, and I didn't have that experience. Not very many people talked to me. A lot of the, the booths, the person at the booth, I didn't necessarily know if it was the artist. I, I don't want to assume, but the way that they were engaging or not engaging really felt like more, this isn't an employee that's been sent here with a giant booth full of prints and a square right. and a phone, and they're just here to sell stuff, right? And so it was not as personal as I'm used to. I did have some conversations with some people that were very lovely, but it was much fewer than I'm used to in a situation like that. And as someone that has not drawn much in the last four or five years, certainly not professionally, and you know has not had any inclination to go to a convention floor to table and sell books and sell prints uh, for a very long time, it was kind of a, a nice it's good that you're not doing this anymore. <laughs> I would have been swimming upstream you know, like, because, because the reason that that stuff is all there is because that's what's selling. Right. And if right. that's what's selling, if that's the trend then I would not be selling anything because I would, st- I'll be doing my own stuff. You know, like I'd be, I've always kind of swam in my own direction. And so I'm kind of glad that I went and had the opportunity in between the panels to walk around because it was not the same sort of vibe. You think you would have had a harder time selling because it didn't match what everyone else was doing as opposed to selling more because it stood out? Yeah, because I because I wasn't doing Hello Kitty stuff. I, I, I think that's the uh, thing is like, like I'm looking for the unique thing, but I don't think I am the common attendee, right? The common attendee is right. not an artist. The common attendee is a fan and they just want cool stuff. Um, there was a lot of kitschy stuff too. Like it wasn't just prints. It was like enamel pins and stickers and like really like little things earrings, stuff like that. Just easy, inexpensive grabs. Yeah, exactly. But also aimed at younger and I would hazard a guess female consumers, you know, in terms of what's being picked up. So it was just, it was an interesting, you know, vibe and very different from when I went to the Dartmouth Comic Arts Festival with James the Civilian this summer. That was a lot more diverse. There was a lot more variety of art and and styles and stuff on display there was still the same old same old but it was fewer and far between there was like four or five tables where you're Mm. like oh yeah i've seen you and i've seen this stuff before whereas at halcon it's just like this is the fifth pokemon (laughs) poster table that i've packed again like it was still a, a good experience to to walk around and see all that stuff and it's nice to see artists you know out there doing their thing but i i wonder if you know conventions could go back to separating out like the independent artists from the people that are selling like prints as a business and right. the lightsaber table and the leather mask table and the people selling wood carving home signs that are geeky you know like it's like it's like a wood burning you know welcome to our home role for initiative and there's a, a carving of a 20 sided die it's very cool and very nerdy but it's not what i want to do or see when i'm walking down artist alley and I kind of wonder right. if they could better organize it to have all of the artists kind of like down in one end and then all of the vendors and all the people just selling stuff, stores essentially, up at the other end or in a different room would would be preferable. But they might be limited for space and mm-hmm. time and organization and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm not necessarily criticizing. It's just like it's something that I would like to see as a potential for, I wonder how that would work out from a vibe. Like I wonder how that would feel for the people that would be walking down the aisles and aisles knowing like oh these are all small independent people and then maybe feel like they'd be more inclined to spend their money there right yeah Hmm. moving into the main discussion because of course this is going to be uh, a large one because uh, Mm -hmm. steven and i have both seen the same thing we are excited to talk about the same thing and uh, it's always good when we are on the same page about Mm -hmm. this kind of stuff it is of course arcane season two act one that is episode one two and three there will be spoilers we will be talking about not only just the plot of of one two and three from this season but more than likely how it pertains to um this first season and of course spoilers for that but that is what three years old now so if you are worried about spoilers on season one then like i'm sorry (laughs) but you need to get back under the rock that you've been under for the last few years 
We did talk about it on this show. I did not look up what episode, but the search function on the citadelcafe.com is very good. So you should be able to find the other episodes of Arcane on uh, the podcast site. No problem. Uh, We'll have links to uh, Arcane as well as Riot Games and League of Legends, which is what Arcane is based on in the show notes at the citadelcafe.com for this episode as well. I was really happy to have the time uh, and thankful to Stephen for reminding me that Arcane Season 2 was coming up because I rewatched Season 1 leading up to Season 2. And fantastic idea because I remember the show fondly, but I had forgotten how complicated it was in the interrelationships between the characters, the subtleties in some of the storytelling, and to watch it again was great. It was also good because the cliffhanger at the end of season one meant that I could just roll into season two because I lined it up. So like I basically finished season one the night that season two premiered. So like, I was like, oh no, what happened? Play. (laughs) Let's find out. (laughs) (laughs) Time enough for a bathroom break and here we go. Crack another beer and watch this. Uh, So (laughs) if if it's something that you've been toying with uh, as a listener, I would say it's 100% worth doing. It really refreshed oh my, goodness. my memory as to the complex character relationships. And uh, I think key moments in a growing cast list of characters to keep straight. And I think it yep. really helps because the plot gets thicker in season two. And you really need to know kind of where people stand at the beginning of season two, if you are to kind of follow along. So how did you feel about rewatching the first season? Did you, did you get a lot out of it as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, and just from a technical perspective, we have a new television. It's not new, but it's new now compared to when we first watched it. And just the resolution alone, it's, it's a bit bigger than it was, but man, the, that was beautiful. Anytime you pause it, it's, it's a work of art. hundred percent. I, I just, I went up to the television screen and it was just looking for imperfections, but it's just, it's so tight. It's, possibly one of the most beautiful animated series i've ever seen it's so good and that's just from a visual perspective but like story-wise as well it was just it's nice to catch up are you on a 4k tv now yes uh actually it may be not 4k but it's uh once it might be 2k i forget if there's like one between regular hd and 4k but we're, we don't have regular hd anymore we've gone up one from that so if it is 4k then yes <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I'm watching on a 4k TV as well. And I pay for whatever the Netflix subscription is for that level, which I think is the highest level in order to get the the 4k, even if you're not, um, most TVs now would have some sort of upscaling. Uh, and I actually, I don't use my TVs upscaling. I, I watch on the Xbox. Like I use the Xbox for all of my media watching because like, why wouldn't you? It has a dedicated video card in it. (laughs) Like it just, Mm. it makes sense to, to use that for any kind of software and and generally speaking the apps on the xbox are a better browsing experience than the television app i have got a roku tv and i find the apps on the roku tv not the best um oh really yeah and just in terms of like navigation and all that kind of stuff plus i'm just i'm way faster with a controller than i am with like a a, a thumb only remote you know like a traditional television right. remote and so it makes yeah. it a lot faster to bop around and you hit b for back and a for select and like all that kind of stuff it's just a lot faster um and certainly if you have to type anything in the controller is great because of course you can just navigate a keyboard on screen much much faster um because they have like suggestive words and things that you can complete so Um, but yeah, I, I've been watching on Netflix and I I agree. I think it just, it's a very pretty show. It always has been, but there's definitely been moments where I'm just jaw agape watching what's happening on screen. Cause I mean, I worked in animation for six or eight years and just knowing the amount of work that goes into every scene, like it's not, there's no phoned in talking heads like everything no. like even just a simple conversation it's like they put the camera on the floor and like they the lighting is very specific and there's just the, the framing like there's thought is put behind every minute of this show and i i feel bad for whatever animated series is coming out in december <laughs> like you're you're up against uh some some big guns you know and i that said like i know that it was obviously a long time and a very expensive show to make and it's not always something that every studio is capable of but man like they did a really really good job with this one 
Zero frames wasted. One thing that I did notice about the first season, and so far they're okay with the second season because it's, I feel like season two picked up immediately after season one and there has not been any time lapse so far. I'm anticipating some time lapse between act one and act two from the trailers that I've seen, but there is a time jump okay. in season one when Vi and uh, Powder go from like 16 and 10 to like 20 and 18 or 22 and 18 or something like that. There's a, there's a decent okay. amount of time, but they never tell you how long. They never really give you a oh. clear number. It's been years, which is obvious. Yeah. And someone says it. I think Vi says that I've been in this prison for years or something like that, but yeah. she doesn't say like... I thought it was five years, but maybe not. Yeah. I, I mean, the general consensus feels like it's around five years because Jinx doesn't look overly like old. She still feels like a young, like 20-ish, you know, yeah. maybe maybe 18-ish. So it's been five to eight years ish again. Like you don't know how old she was when they started. Right. Because yeah, the, the, both kids have been through trauma. So like powder in season one is acting younger than she probably is because of what she's been through. And Vi is acting older than she probably is because of what she's been through. Right. And so it's hard to kind of pin down, but that was my only real criticism <laughs> of the first one. Cause I do remember kind of like pausing it after, after that happens. Like, Oh, right there's a jump here. And I immediately went to the internet. Like it's been years. Certainly someone knows, <laughs> you know, nobody knows. Like there's no concrete number anywhere that I could find. Um, and, and that led me actually to digging up some, some lore about the world, because after watching season one and getting ready for season two, I really wanted to know a little bit more, but it's really hard to track down any reliable and I'll say watchable resource on the lore of League <laughs> of Legends, because Basically, it sounds like fans of the game really have only about as much as, as, you know, the website has, which is a brief blurb about the character, like the hero that's in the game. And then also a, a, a bit of a history about the, um, the realms or the different areas, the different, you know, countries and areas that people are from. And I know that there's other games, not just League of Legends, that all happen in the same universe. One of them that, that comes to mind is Legends of Runeterra, which is a digital card game kind of based on Magic the Gathering, but it's like a, it's not a physical game. You have to, it's played online like Hearthstone. And oh, gotcha. there is a companion book to League of Legends that goes into the history of the different realms. Uh, and that's called League of Legends Realms of Runeterra. And it looks like it might be similar to the Chronicles World of Warcraft books that I've had. And those were really good because they talk about like how the world was formed and how the gods became the gods and how they fell and then how different heroes rose and how different races came to be and what their history was. And so that I always found was really interesting because I played World of Warcraft for years and I was looking for something like that for League of Legends or for Arcane and I just couldn't find it. And I think what's happening is essentially Arcane is that resource. So it's it's not that you have to go find the lore of Arcane. It's that Arcane is the lore for league right. of legends right so they're kind of writing as they go along and i'm hoping that they do more story games because i am on board like they've really created a deep interconnected story with these characters and i mean i'm i'm really really happy with the writing so far so in, in your deep dive have, did you do you know how i guess how true this series is to what the lore of this game is meant to be or is this sort of were the given the the creators given creative license to just sort of create a tale within that world, and it is just sort of eh, it's a standalone thing that doesn't necessarily inform the game. Or did you find any information on that? Just so the only information that I can bring is what YouTubers have put out there, and they say they have a source, but they're just saying, well, the riot has said that they want Arcane to be canon, like they want the new stories to be okay. told here to be canon. And I'm only going off the YouTuber that I listened to that was the easiest to listen to and didn't just sound like they were reading the website. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff where you, someone would be doing like this dramatic voice, like I'm doing, I'm doing my voice over voice for telling you the lore of League of Legends. But then the words that they were saying, you could tell that they were written by someone very young and you're like, mm, I don't like, that doesn't strike me as a legitimate source for this. Like I I'll take this with a grain of salt. And a lot of it is just disjointed 
and then this happened and then this happened and meanwhile and meanwhile and meanwhile so really all they're doing is just grabbing the bios and the information that's out there and just putting it into what they think is the order in which it goes and so there's no real lore in that way but yeah it it does feel that the the efforts and and things that are happening with arcane are being treated very seriously by everyone involved as like where they're going to move forward with it i hope they do because it's way more interesting than just like sisters that fought or don't get along anymore one's a cop and one's a psycho like there's way more nuance to it now um uh, to it in arcane sorry than there is in the league of legends and i think that that's something that they're leaning on and the writing for season two continues to be top-notch compared to a lot of other modern shows drama or like live action or animated uh, i think that um arcane has got better writing than a lot of stuff that i've tried to watch yeah. in recent years and i think everybody that's making shows should pay attention like i would much rather wait two years for a extraordinarily well-written well-thought-out show that's only got 10 episodes than to r- watch something that's been pushed out in a couple of years and just is okay and is yeah. more of the same you know, more of what's thought to be popular or what they is thought to be driving subscriptions. Like just, just make good stuff, make great stuff. And people will come to watch it. Like people will show up because people like you and I, and people that care about story will just be, you know, champing at the bit and championing your show to say like, everybody needs to go watch this. I don't care if you like animation. I don't care. I have never played league of legends. The only thing I know about it is it's a toxic environment for a lot of players. <laughs> it's not a nice place to play video games. Apparently it can be pretty harsh. Yeah. And I know that from someone I know that used to play. So I've never, I've never loaded it up. I've seen it. I know what it is. I've played other, uh, MOBAs, but like this, it just, it's never been my bag. I love the artwork. You know, like I, I've spoken and interviewed a couple of people that have done artwork for Riot Games and it's beautiful stuff and it's cool ideas, but like I, I just, I have no stock in it. So to go into Arcane completely blind and be blown away and hooked, I think it speaks to the show for sure. I do feel that there's been a little bit more fan service in season two. I'm curious as to whether you've noticed this or not. And it's not jarring. It doesn't take me out of it. I just sort of noticed like a few long camera shots or teaser like reveals or hints where it's obviously like, if you know, you know, like this is somebody. I'm just like, I don't know who that is. That looks important, but I don't know who that is. <laughs> you know, And I feel like they're hanging on those a little bit more than they were in season one, which is funny because you think in season one, they would have tried to hook a bunch of people by like showing all the stuff they were going to have in the, in the, the show and the champions that they were going to um, represent. But I've just, I've noticed a couple of like really like cliffhangery fade to black. Like here's a dark lab with a weird creature in the background with, I guess the guy's name is Singed. He was in the season one. He's got like the mask and he's the doctor that fixed Jinx and is always, you know, manipulating creatures biologically. And he's just like doing something creepy, fade to black with something creepy (laughs) in the black background. And just like that happens a couple of times. Just like, okay, it's like, obviously this is hinting at something and I'm supposed to know who this is and i've found out through my search and you know looking for lore there's also a couple of like fan theories and ideas about like what is singe doing what's the creature in the background and people have put out some some thoughts on that too i'm avoiding stating what it is in case people don't know so i don't, I don't want to lean anybody in any direction because these people could be completely wrong and i don't necessarily want everyone watching season two thinking that this is what's happening right and you don't have to confirm or deny either way, but like I've like those those scenes with the doctor, he, those have been like the the post credit cut scenes where they just sort, sort of, of yeah, you just show a little bit. And the last shot they show has a large humanoid figure being sort of hung over whatever lab he's got going on, and to me it looks like mutated Vander from the end of season one's story arc one. So I'm not sure if you don't again don't have to deny it or confirm it but just like based on everyone that they've had in the show so far that looks like him like the big hulking mutated version of him but i'll be i'll be curious to see how it goes because they've been just like just poking at it a little bit if it's him and, and i i kind of hope it is it's it's funny I, I i kind of hope it is and i kind of hope it isn't because 
if they bring him back, that's going to totally mess with both Vi and Jinx. Oh, yeah. Which I think it could go either way. It could either mess with them and make the story really interesting, or it's like it or it could almost go in the way that we've brought Vander back just for the sake, you know, just to stir things up and have it not necessarily pan out. But as you as you said, like the writing in this has been amazing so far. And like for a video game show, it has no business being this good. So but I have sort of faith that if it is Vander and he comes back, that it's going to mess things up in a good way. But I'm still we'll see. Especially for a video game that's not renowned for its story. You know, like The Last of Us is renowned for its story. And it's no wonder that the television show based on it did well and was well received. League of Legends is it's an action game. It's a dopamine hit. It's not it's not meant to be a deep story driven game. It was never has been. It's developed over time to have backstory and and world mm. building. But that's different than than really having character relationships, which don't really exist from what I can tell. Other than this, like, you know, this person hates this person and this person used to be in love with this person, but now they're, you know, that person died and now this person is like, you know, an evil soul sucking monster. Like there's, there's all kinds of weird stuff that happens in the champion descriptions and stuff. I've been to the, the Riot website a little bit before the show, just kind of like see what characters look like in the game versus what they look like in the show. And that kind of stuff has been cool too. Uh, and that, I guess, brings me to my other broad point, which is like the animation in season two continues to be absolutely beautiful. It's impactful. Yeah. It's pushing boundaries. There are just so many cool visualizations specifically for Jinx and her mental instability and how they portray that to the viewer is so well done. And it's, it's a little bit hard to follow sometimes um, <laughs> in terms of just how much they throw on screen. But like, that's the idea. Like that's, it's on purpose. I'm sure they understand that it's a lot to take in because I mean, what would it be like to have the kind of trauma that Jinx has? It would be a lot to take, you know? And I think that that's yeah. communicated quite clearly. The drawback I think is sometimes the fight scenes are a bit hard to follow. There's a lot of quick camera moves and extreme close-ups, which is very, um, I don't know if you know this, but it's very <sighs> common in heavy action French animated stuff. The the camera tends to be very close to the action. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, like instead of like a roundhouse kick um, where you can see the figure, the roundhouse kick is going to happen over the camera. Like the foot is going to disappear out of frame. And so that's been something that I've noticed about that kind of style of animation for quite some time. And it's cool and it has a lot of impact, but it also, when you're like, I just want to see how cool this character looks like, could you just <laughs> hold them still for just a second? <laughs> you know, like, and there's, and they do that sometimes with slow motion. Um, the, the, the fight that I'm thinking of in particular in season two is Smeech, who is like this mechanically enhanced rat thing. I'm not exactly sure yeah. what species he is. And Savika, who is, uh, um, Silco's right hand, lady before Soko died um she's the one with the mechanical arm and yeah. jinx fixes the arm and then her and shmeech go at it and it is violent and fast and hard hitting but also like several times i just went what just happened mm. just i don't understand what i'm looking at and what just happened and so it was a little bit hard to follow but but still like overall very well well done right i love actually what they're doing I mean, they did it in season one as well, where they include different art styles to sort of hit certain parts of the mood home, so to speak. Like in in uh, season one, there was uh, the fight scene between Echo and Jinx at the end. It switched to this sort of raw, sort of graffiti style artwork for chunks of the battle. And then it would switch back and forth between that art style and... Mm -hmm. actual live action and and in this one it was um season one or sorry part of episode one started or uh, after the credits had the funeral for caitlin's mom after the explosion and it was just charcoal drawing for all the scenes except for the main characters and they were they were placed in the charcoal drawing you know whether it was real charcoal drawing or whether it was done on computer, I like paused it a few times, and it's just it looks like somebody literally did a charcoal drawing, and then you had this bright pop of a main character standing in that. So it was just it, it was a great way to show the mood, and then just show this how it just what was a normally sort of brilliant and vibrant color everywhere was just 
desaturated completely into grayscale and then but, but you still had the main character just pop on it and I thought it was a beautiful way to show the mood well i think it also showed from caitlin's perspective what she was thinking about right like i mean everything yeah, was completely gray except for her mother and the flowers i think it was herself she was remembering as a little girl and then in a wider crowd shot it was like nothing but vi right and it was yeah. like these are the things that are currently present in Caitlin's mind as she's going throughout the day. Oh, interesting! And I'll have to go back and watch it. Yeah, it was a really cool way to show that. But I mean, in the same way, it's also like you said, it was drawing the viewer's attention to what's important in the scene, which is like what's mm -hmm. Vi, what's Vi's mood, like how's Vi handling this. Um, what's important here is like the the flowers and the and the the memories of being somewhere with her mother. I think was like the public gardens or something is that they seem to go there a lot. And so there's just all these different things that they're trying to, to present. And I think they did that very well. I agree. One of the things that I think for me stands out is the character relationship. So like all of my thoughts for today are character based as opposed to plot based. Cause I, there's not really much to say about the plot cause it's only been act one. So it really is just kind of getting off the ground for season two. Um, mm -hmm. But I, absolutely love Vi. I liked her <laughs> in season one and I thought she was great, you know, like, and, I, and you're always rooting for her. Um, obviously there was some mistakes that she made, but like, I really like her in season two. They have done a really good job making this tough as nails character have really raw, emotionally vulnerable moments, especially with Caitlin. There are some with, jinx or about jinx as well but it's the caitlin stuff that breaks down vi's walls and you really get to see all sides of her when caitlin is around and i am 100 percent on board for the relationship between vi and caitlin like i know it's it's having some rough spots <laughs> in, in season two so yeah. far <laughs> uh but like i it's i can't remember the last time that i rooted for a relationship in a cartoon yeah you know yeah, yeah. Like maybe avatar the last airbender maybe maybe legend of korra but like not like this like i teared up a little when they embraced in caitlin's home after the funeral when vi was there and she wasn't sure if she should be there and like she wasn't sure if it was going to be is caitlin's going to scream at me or is this going to be welcome and caitlin just collapses into her arms like totally teared up yeah it is so raw with either good or bad emotions in the show they really really nail it and and i think that goes to show like obviously the voice acting and stuff but the the acting from the animators and the people behind getting emotion out of these models in a computer is just remarkable and i i really like both the the physical way that they portray that but then also the writing and the beats and the situations that they put them in and the roller coaster that these characters go on like moments later mm -hmm. um caitlin hands vi a badge and and says like you should you know help fix the problem you are uniquely qualified to do it and as if like because i forgot that caitlin's no um vi's parents were killed by enforcers and yeah you're just like what it's like it, it takes a minute to sink in because there's so much that happens in that bridge in season one like you forget that it's not always vander's people versus silco's people it was it used to be vander and silco together versus um piltover and the enforcers and yeah like it's it just it really really everybody's got uh thorns i guess yeah. and well, that's a good way to put it you know and and they it, like no one has just like a singular role that they play in the show, you know, like everyone has these things that will set them off and, and they're not like character quirks, they're deep seated trauma. <laughs> you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, very, yeah, yeah. very real. And, and it, it really shows, I think like, because of just how much Vi has been through that Caitlin can bring out that kind of emotion in her from a, a safe perspective just kind of speaks to their relationship. And they do so much with that without them actually having to sit down and have a talk. Like they don't, they don't flirt with one another. They don't have a romantic 
um, conversation. It's silence. It's holding hands on a bed. You know, it's saving one another's lives. It's, mm. you know, it's, it's embraces during terrible moments. Like it's, it's not a traditional cartoon romance. Well, I mean, it's, it's also very likely, I mean, they didn't show it. So very likely Vi's first relationship ever. True. Yeah. Poten- potentially, because she went from being a kid who was like the leader of this gang to being in prison for five to eight years or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so having basically, you know, in prison, who who knows what kind of relationship she had in there, but they, they alluded to the fact that she was beaten on a regular basis. So anything that she, relationship wise she had in there was likely not the most tender. So this is very likely the first glimpse of an actual romantic relationship she's ever had. So it's, I mean, it's just so, it feels so layered. <laughs> oh, it really is. Yeah, it really is. I'm glad with, that they started with that. Like, I'm glad that they set off the series kind of like centered around them because the series season one was centered around Vi and Powder slash Jinx. And while that relationship is still really prominent, they're not really in each other's presence very much in season two. And it's more of a Vi Caitlin duo right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that tension is going to bring to the story. Did you, do you think that the season two started where you thought it was going to? We, we were actually having a we flip flopped. Like my family and I, we were, we were all trying to guess and, sort of hypothesize how it would start out because you know they did the did the time jump as you mentioned in season one so they could have done it so that this was three to five years after trying to rebuild you know once you know the council that we all knew was wiped out and then you know this is where it picks up or is it going to be immediately where it dropped off or were they going to do sort of maybe tell the lead up to that point from a different point of view so that it you know took maybe a day step back leading up to it again and then have it happen. But it was, uh, I'm glad they picked it up right, right where it left off because, and and, and as as you pointed out, especially having rewatched season one again, to just have the projectile strike the building. And then the way it started with essentially Jace and the others just opened their eyes and all of the sounds being muffled because they didn't have ears ringing, but you know, Mm -hmm. how it's hard to hear after a loud noise it's just i I think it was the perfect way to start it and and it almost feels like they were counting on people watching season one again just to time it so that you're going from one episode to another because it was it seemed written exactly for that it was so good how about you how did you see it i wasn't really sure how they were going to pick up i mean i i thought immediately they were going to address what happened to the counselors i was surprised that some people were still alive. Like I, I really mm. was worried that Mel was going to die because the last shot of season one was basically like her looking over her shoulder at the missile, right? Like it just, it, she was sitting at the window when it hit. And yeah, I, I so I was surprised that she was okay. And I mean, like when I say, okay, I mean like not even a scratch. Okay. And so that was surprised, but I mean, happily surprised because I really like that character. We have theories about that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I found out a couple of theories through my like lore research as well. I knew some of them were going to die, but I kind of thought it would be the the ones that you generally don't like, the old fuddy duddy. Yeah. The the one that the one that's selfish. Kind of the weaselly guy, the tall, skinny, weaselly guy. I forget what his name is. I can't remember his name either. Uh, the mechanical one that like doesn't really like has some things to say, but really doesn't contribute a whole lot other than repeating what's going around the table. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of other people like that too. There's another, I don't know where she's from, but she's got a lot of gold, um, face jewelry, I guess. Cause I, I'm not sure. I can't remember what country there or region she'd be from, but, um, mm. there's a couple like that. And then, uh, so it was a surprise when it was Caitlin's mom that died in, in the, the three that passed away. And to me, it was like, the show's not afraid to kill like a really prominent character, which you knew from when Vander dies, right? Like you really, right. That's you really are uh, going, Oh crap. Like Vander's the guy that you, not that he was going to necessarily punch and save the day, but like you kind of expected him to be at least a consistent father figure through it. That's what I felt anyway. Yeah. You, you felt that he was going to be that, that, that voice, you know, throughout the series. Uh, Not that he was going to buy it so early on, especially because like, again, 
he's got those cool punching gauntlet things that he made. And so like <laughs> that to me makes me think like, well, I don't know, but it looks like he's probably a champion from League of Legends that they've kind of like given a, this is what he was like before he was a champion in League of Legends. So right. like, you don't think that they're necessarily going to kill any of their champions, right? So it's hard to say without, you know, when you have no knowledge, you know, there's no one's got plot armor, you know, like that I know of. So, uh, yeah. except for like the ones that I now know, like, you know, Jinx, fan favorite, Vi, fan favorite, you know, like there's probably a few others that I, I would imagine people would be really upset if they died in an explosion. You know, um, Heimer, Heimerdinger, another thing that would be terrible, <laughs> you know, if he, if he was one of the, <laughs> you know, if he, the cute little, you know, fuzzy Ewok character dies in the explosion, like people would be mad. It's been alive for 700 years or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So like it's, there's some, there's stuff like that, that you're like, well, they're probably not going to, not going to buy it. But yeah, I, I did not expect it to have such a heavy emotional weight to kick off the season. Mm -hmm. And, and they keep on getting twisted. The character, what's her name? Mbessa, uh, Mel's mom. Oh yeah. Yeah. She makes a really good antagonist because she's the combo of like tough physical presence and intimidation, but also like cunning scheming behind the scenes manipulation uh, like she's a true warmonger and mm -hmm. it's revealed in episode two or episode three that the event happens in episode two, where they have a memorial for all these counselors that have passed. And there's an attack from Undercity attacks the, the memorial. And the reveal is that uh, Mbessa was behind the attack and basically fueled the people in Zon, the Undercity, to come up and attack and facilitated it because what she wants is Piltover to weaponize and get Hextech going into weapons, not tools. And she wants it for herself, but she can't develop it herself. So she's forcing mm. Piltover out of fear to react. And she knows that fear is the fastest way to get reactions out of people. And, and it doesn't matter who dies. And that's the thing that is just wild to me. Like she's not a good person, you know? No. And and they really they really do a good job. You despise her, but you still I don't want to say respect her because that's not the right word. Yeah, I was trying to think of another word for respect as well. It's not that you respect her, but you respect the danger you're in when you're around her. There's something about the respect for her commitment to seeing through her her needs or her vision as well. And not that I'd say she's a good character, but it just, there's something about. She's relentless. Yeah. Like she's not, she's going to yeah. stop at nothing to get what she wants. And she's capable of her moral compass is just non-existent. <laughs> and so it's got its own magnet <laughs> because of that. Like, you know, that she will do anything. And because anything is on the table, it's, it's like, Oh God, like I need to keep this character yeah. away from my favorites. You know what I mean? Because she would have been perfectly fine if Jace had died, right? Like she doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the only the only thing about that is that she knows that she needs Hextech and that she needs him around technically, not that she wants him around. Mm -hmm. But it's it's one of those things where I find her character very interesting, but at the same time, one of the things that bugs me about humanity in general is that people just manipulate other people, and it's just it feels like it's just one of the seediest things you can just do. And so it felt like her character was going to be like that from season one, even though we didn't really see a lot of it in season one. But now that I know, she just, she's a cool character in terms of story, but I just, she's. And Bessa hits close to home in terms of real world stuff, I think. Yeah, maybe that's it. It makes your skin crawl. I also think that they do a really good job in terms of antagonists with Jinx, because mm -hmm. they balance Jinx really well between the viewer feeling bad for her finding her appealing and cool because like she's funny <laughs> you know she's quirky <laughs> she's got cool shit you know <laughs> like she blows stuffs up like it just there's a certain amount of like action and fun and just like mayhem that is cathartic with jinx but then <laughs> because she's in the mix with people that you care about in the show like caitlin and vi you're also afraid of what she'll do next because she will do anything and it is obvious yeah. that like characters that you think are going to last probably won't and mm -hmm. jinx is very likely going to have a hand in that potentially coming to be 
It started with the bomb when, with powder, you know, the thing that hold, that set her off and down this train track. But then also... Oh, that was a tough scene to rewatch. It just felt so bad. I mean, sorry to interrupt, but it was just... She wanted so badly to help. And man, did that go sideways in the worst way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then like, even when she kills uh, Silco, you're happy Silco's dead. You're glad that she defended Vi and saved Vi's life. But then she's also heartbroken because she's now killed her father or her father figure or adoptive, like whatever, whatever manipulative yeah, yeah. relationship they had. She was, un- she was under the also influence. Oh yeah. She was yeah. under the influence of him. And then to have that, like to have, like if he had died, she would be free. But if, because she killed him, mm, like, is she free? Like yeah. it just, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. layers of the Jinx onion are numerous and yeah, like I think they do a really good job of like keeping you afraid of Jinx, like afraid of what she's going to do without hating her. It would be very difficult to understand Vi if you hated Jinx. Yeah. But instead you tend to feel bad for Jinx. You wouldn't buy into the struggle, like the the um the moral struggle between Vi and Caitlin and their relationship and wanting to save Jinx. Like if if Jinx was just unredeemable and not likable you'd be like well the decision's easy just just kill her and move on but yeah i, I agree she's a, a really really complex and interesting character what were the theories that you had about mel oh it was just she's got gold plating all over her skin which which it looks very cool i thought it was a really cool character design but just just before the projectile goes through the window of the council hall that gold just shimmers. And at first I thought, oh, that's just because you've got this glowing hex gem projectile coming in that the light from it just sh- shined off her back or shone off her back. But then we were thinking, yeah, maybe that's something different than just gold. And then at the very, very, very intro scene of the show, it's out of focus, but then you, and you see this sort of shimmer and this gold shimmer just kind of go along with the sound. You shh, and then it, that disappears. And then Jace and Mel come into focus. I didn't pick up on it right away. And I was like, that's kind of weird that they just came out with it a scratch. I said, they're probably, you know, we were making jokes about them wearing plot armor and just well, surprised that they would do this in the show. But one of my sons was actually, I didn't clue in that he was doing this, but it's like, no, 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 it's Vi's shimmer of gold. And we thought it was referencing season one. But either way, it's pretty much our family theory and probably a pretty solid one that there's some sort of match going on with her, her gold plating, but. So you mean, you mean Mel's gold? You said Vi. Did not mean Vi. Yeah. Sorry. Mel's gold plating. So with Mel, from what I can tell, and I don't remember what region this happened in, but in my little lore adventure, um, there is like a celestial dragon called Aurelian soul. And there's a sun disc that was made by some people hundreds of years ago that captures his energy and imbues it into the people around. And they all have what's referred to as sun armor and it's all gold. And so there's a several League of Legends champions like Azir and I want to say Akshan and there's other ones that have like very Aztec looking designs, very gold armor, very, um, lots of suns and arcs and moons and things in their designs. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I think from again, like, again, I might be misremembering because I watched like three or four YouTube videos by people that were kind of going down this rabbit hole. Their idea was just like what you said, that shimmer was supposed to indicate to you that Mel's armor is really I don't know what it's technically called sun armor in the world of arcane and league of legends. And it has special okay. abilities and powers. Uh, and so, cause Mel is a champion. I think I'm scrolling through things r- really quickly, but I, I don't see her. I don't know whether she becomes a different character because sometimes they have like different names and sometimes they look wildly different in the champions list than they do in, in, uh, arcane. Uh, but it sounds like she's from a tribe that, um, has that ability. And Bessa is a champion that like, she's someone that you mm. can play in the game. Okay. 
And so I wouldn't be surprised if her daughter, you know, up against her would also be someone that you could play in the game because that would make sense and cause for like some fun little like in-game drama, you know, like little one-liners between mother daughter as they kind of face off against one another in the game. I wonder if we're getting to that side of the lore though in, in this series. I mean, it's only got six episodes left, but yeah, it feels like if they're going to actually use that as a way to keep main characters from getting even a scratch on them, that it's got to have, I feel like they've got to touch on it a tiny bit. And there might be more to it. Maybe Mel will pick up some arms in the next few episodes and, and we'll see some more mm. from her. It's, I think it's hard to say. I would say that Mel is, I believe, going to be someone to eventually face her mother because I think Mel is the only person her mother won't kill. Yeah. She might be the only person that can stop her. I don't really know. That's kind of where I, where I went with it. I, and that's just because I've been led down that path by other people on the internet. It's not that I feel like I'm any authority <laughs> on it, nor do I know if they are. I think that's just a fan, a fan theory. But it's a cool one. I mean, I'm on, I'm on board for it. It would certainly explain a little bit. And I think you're right. Like, I think they have to try to explain that a little bit because the rocket that came in there was ginormous. I'm kind of surprised yeah. that the whole thing isn't a smoking crater, <laughs> you know? Well, if, uh, to be honest, I felt like it should have been because it was X tech that you know makes mm. everything that it's in that much more powerful if it was just a missile on its own it would have done that kind of damage but if it was a hex or sorry hex gem missile it should have vaporized everything but that that is that aside but. yeah the only thing i'll say to that is that several of the hex tech explosions that we've seen in season one didn't really do a lot of damage to the buildings like it blew mm. out windows but it didn't necessarily topple buildings and it's a magic explosion, not a physical explosion. I know the rocket had both. Fair enough. Right? Like, I know the rocket had both. So, they're like, both happened. But I feel like the Hextech stuff, like, it's it has a different effect. It's not quite the same shockwave that you'd expect from a ballistic missile. And so, I'm kind of giving it a bit of a pass there, only because, like, I don't understand what the heck it is. <laughs> like I, yeah, well, it's fair enough, too, because it would it would have been a different kind of projectile anyway, because unless I'm remembering it wrong the missile would have gone through the window so it wouldn't have necessarily hit the building and blown up the side of the building it would have exploded inside yeah anyway overthinking it i guess but but they, they all would have been sitting at the table when it hit like my gosh <laughs> you know, like, yeah at least the burn damage on the skin should have been a lot higher than it was <laughs> yeah like do you, well i mean if it's jinx fired it for all we know a bunch of little bunny rabbit to stuffed toys popped out of it at the last <laughs> minute and exploded like who knows right yeah but speaking of, of Jace and speaking of like how Hex Core works, I think this is the only part of the series so far. And again, I'm being light on criticism because it's only act one. I really have not felt that Jace and Heimerdinger and Echo were used very effectively so far. No. They just seem to be your point of view for weird shit happening with the Hex Core. It goes mm. from being magic and runes to being organic to being really creepy looking like it almost like horror movie-esque in terms of like the cocoon that victor's in and right. the, the webbing that heimerdinger notices in the hex core which is apparently really deep underground and they're like they just kind of are walking through a series of tunnels figuratively and literally for the first three episodes and basically just talking back and forth and the dialogue that they're sharing is basically just kind of informing the viewer weird stuff is happening with hex core mm -hmm. and weirdly heimerdinger never says told you so <laughs> like he's yeah, yeah. he's the one that's been around for a while and he's the one that is normally giving you like the yoda like attributes of like i've been around for 300 years i've seen this happen before this is what mages do with it this i totally know what this is and he's not doing that. He's doing like Mission Impossible spoof comedy relief. And it's like, <laughs> mm, it's cute and funny and stuff. And a little bit like if he's supposed to be a brilliant scientist, he's acting kind of dumb right now. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit strange in that they're not utilizing him more for like, you could be really informing your audience. It's like, what is the history of this thing? It's like, I've only seen this yeah. once before. And it was when this red mage flew above the city and did X, Y, Z. I don't know. Just make something up give the audience something more from from heimerdinger and again jace is basically just like a yes man he's just kind of along for the ride at this point yeah but it's funny you're you're talking about heimerdinger is almost not word for word but your sentiment is almost bang on what my younger son said he just we were talking about it today and he's just like that's his only complaint is just 
they feel like he, he feel like he's Helmerdinger is being underused and he's just there for comic relief. Like mm-hmm. he seems very cartoon character now, as opposed to, as you said, this wise little all knowing character. So yeah, that's no, funny. I mean, that's kind of where I've stopped because I'm, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. Like I'm not trying to predict what's mm-hmm. going to happen. I am curious about some of the new characters, but like, I don't even remember their names. I don't feel attached to them yet. Like they just, they look cool to me. I'm worried that they're being introduced to get you slightly attached to them, to have them suddenly be red shirts that they're going to kill. I mean, not even, Mm -hmm. you know, basically make you care about them a little bit so that they can be more collateral damage to what's going on between Vi and Jinx kind of thing. But, I can't remember what they're called. They're from an area that starts with an I. And they are the kind of like cat fox like looking people. Oh yeah. The one of the one of the champions is called Ari, I think. And then there's another one too. There's a couple different ones. But in this particular scene, it was this service tattoo thing that was happening with the counselor that we don't like the blonde guy and this oh, ca- right. this cat character or I, again i'm not i'm i forgive me people that know but there's just so much to remember in terms of like cuz cuz they're not they don't call them a like there's no species because the 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 overarching name for this p- kind of people you would look at them and think that's like four different races but they refer mm. to them all as the same thing because they're all from the same area and they're all kind of like mystical in origin. And anyway, it's a really interesting character because of her ears, she, they feel and hear everything. And so they're a great informant. And Mel has a conversation with them behind curtains at a concert somewhere. Right, right. And it was just really, really interesting to hear like, their take on i think that was when mel realized that her mother was really dangerous because this character was telling mel that um ambessa was like cornered like a cat or something like that Mm -hmm. it was basically like i know when someone's in a corner and fearful and that's what uh your mother is and mel was like oh no that's that's not good (laughs) like that that's the worst place that you can put her you know um and so i like those kind of characters i find very intriguing because i definitely what I like so much about the world of, of arcane is like, you've got humans and you've got some augmented humans, but you've also got some weird stuff and, and some like chem tech, apparently it's called, and you've got hex tech. And then there's also shimmer and everything else that's involved there. And like, there's just, there's so many different underlying things where you've got like, not just different races and fantasy creatures, but then they're also like half machine or half snake or like like Mm. you don't know there's a lot of mysticism in the world too and so it's kind of interesting to see how they're bringing that into a more serious world like arcane and giving it some real weight and i got the impression even though it wasn't like this character wasn't in the counselor's chambers as a sex worker you kind of got that vibe right Uh, they reminded me of any scene from mm-hmm. like a 1920s set mobster movie where the lady that sings at the nightclub in front of the big band and she's on the arm of one of the biggest mobsters, but not by choice, you know, because she's scared she's going to yeah. die if she ever walks away. That's the kind of vibe I got from this character that, you know, they're part of this underbelly that they don't necessarily want to be, but they have to be because they're in Piltover and they're you know, down on their luck or they're looked down upon because of what they are and they can't get ahead in life. And so the only thing they have is, is the information that they can sell. Like it just, it felt very cool, like mobster esque. And that was very intriguing, but we didn't get very much of it. Well, one of the reasons I'm glad I rewatched season one is because I completely forgot what happened to Victor's character in the end, because I I knew some things happened with him between him and the hex core. But then as we were, I think, I forget, it was episode seven or something like that. And I, was, I, I said, I don't remember what happens to him. Like, does he die at the end of this? And so that I would, yeah, grateful to have watched season one again, figured out what happened to his, his character and and his intro to season two is basically on death's door. And 
then having him imbued with basically have the hex core just I don't know how to how would you word it, but it's absorbed into his body, physically absorbed into his body at this point. He's become this almost not a deity, but like almost this almost Jesus Christ like savior character who's a prophet and just walking through the the um I can't remember the name of where it is. It's a section in Zon where all of the addicts go. The people that are Yeah, all using the shimmer shimmer yeah, addicts, rat, yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. And uh where he he heals one of them, the, the sort of I guess the main one of the characters, not one of the main characters, but I guess what you would call a main side character from season one, who is uh, an addict and part of the plot, gets healed completely and it looks to be physically fitter than that character's ever been in his entire life. So I'm really intrigued to see where they take that. Yeah, Victor to me was a surprise. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, having just rewatched the season one, like I knew that. He, I knew that he likely wasn't going to die, but I just, the cocoon thing, I was like, oh, that is wildly different than what I was expecting. Like I was yeah. expecting kind of like metal man, you know, and they, they took it in, a, in mm. a different direction. But I think that there's a lot of French influence, obviously, because it's a French animation studio, but the, the character design is, is really, really unique. And, and it's something, again, I love about the show is like, you think you know where it's going because you've seen so much north american produced stuff and then you realize oh just because this is like a north american ip doesn't mm. mean that it's necessarily going to be cookie cutter and and predictable and i think that they do a good job visually and and conceptually for that kind of thing and if you've i'll, I'll send you a link after but okay the design of victor <laughs> in link of legends as a champion absolutely nothing unrecognizable <laughs> compared to oh really oh yeah no he looks like the tin man from wizard of oz at first like he just <laughs> there's all kinds of different versions of him of course but like it's yeah it's a it's a wild wild ride um and i think honestly like they might be taking the opportunity to redesign him for our king mm it's so yeah it just it's they've definitely taken it in a really interesting direction and i think that's one of the reasons i mean obviously what victor looks like now and what is happening to the hex core is is uh and what's powering the hex gates i think is really tied together because it has the same visual design very organic kind of looking and i'm mm -hmm. not sure i'm not sure what to expect and again that's it's a fun feeling I'm trying to think of like, if this was a Warner Brothers superhero show, we would kind of know what would happen next. You know? Yeah. It really would not be a surprise. They'd be bonking you over the head with the obviousness right away. Well, we will, of course, be revisiting our discussions about Arcane as Act 2 and Act 3 come out throughout November. I think it's all due to be on Netflix before the end of November. I think it's, I think the final act comes out Thanksgiving weekend in the States. So, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. So it should be oh, easy to, <laughs> yeah, it should be easy to watch. It <laughs> didn't even clue into that, but yeah. And then give some feedback on, on the show, uh, because there'll be more coming this weekend and I cannot wait. Mm -hmm. Moving into the internet minute, the Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server that's shared with my personal Discord. So there's lots of people in there. You'll also have access to the Barista Cut bonus audio and the extended version of the podcast. When we have a time to record that, you get access to that on the Patreon page. Special thanks to our Bean Counter patrons, Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support of this episode. Patron count is 24, which is steady on from the last time that we recorded. Our goal each time we sit down is to have one more patron. If you would like to be patron number 25, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I have got a Lego pick from Star Wars this time around. Uh, I went scouring looking for some new Lego sets to talk about, and uh, there weren't a lot, uh, but this is something that I wanted to mention, uh, not necessarily because it's my cup of tea, but because it is one of the larger Star Wars sets to come out in a while. This is Jabba's Sail Barge. It retails for uh -huh. $650 Canadian. That is a monster price. Like, that's, that's approaching the 
Millennium Falcon and some of the really, really big sets. Uh, there are 11 minifigures, 3,943 pieces. It is set number 75397. 10 inches high, 10 inches deep, and 31 inches long. This is not a small piece oh my of goodness. kit. Like you are this, you are a display case person if you are getting this. You are or you're going to be dusting it forever because uh it's a large like it would maybe fit on the underside of a coffee table if you set it up right um it's a it's a big big model it's not really something that i would expect like to me it's not an iconic design from star wars like it's yeah, recognizable it's but it's not something that it's not like the millennium falcon it's not an x-wing you know like it's not like stuff you see on posters everywhere and it's very expensive for what it is so again it's not on my hit list it is neat that they put the time in to design the inside so it has several different rooms, including uh, like Jabba's throne room, the um, prep room for R2-D2 in the kitchen where he's got like the drinks on him and stuff. And I think there's one other room inside too. I think it's, oh, the jail, the the, the brig is in there too. Um, <laughs> lots of cool minifigures, you know, you got Bib Fortuna, you've got uh, Salacious Crumb, there's a Gamorrean guard, uh, R2-D2, C-3PO, uh, Princess Leia in the slave outfit. Uh, all that kind of stuff. I can't remember the blue guy's name, but he, the guy that plays the piano in the show, he's in there too. Uh, they have the names on the websites too. Uh, Max Rebo is the character's name. So they're, I mean, they're all there. I, it seems to me like it's more yeah. of a collector's set. Like if you, if you are a, I collect all the Star Wars Lego, I have to have it all. Then this is yeah definitely aimed at you and your wallet. <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting choice. Like you said, it's not really an iconic thing. And, and like in terms of the characters that are there, the only characters that i would say would be of the the list of main main ones would be c-3po princess leia and r2d2 and the rest of them are you know people characters that were on the ship mm -hmm. but nothing that would make me feel like oh this is luke skywalker's battle scene with boba fett here i, I gotta have this kind of thing it's a yeah it, it's a really cool looking design and as you said the rooms with the panels that fold down that actually allow you to go in and play in the rooms is pretty slick I think that does exist. Like, I think there is a Lego Sarlacc pit, but it's like a play set. And then this right. is like, like UCS level thing. Yeah. The Lego desert skiff and Sarlacc pit. So the, the set with the Sarlacc pit, what you get is the thing that Han Solo and Chewie and Lando were on that Luke Skywalker jumped from because they were all going to be executed. They were all going to be put into the Sarlacc pit. And then, R2-D2 shoots the lightsaber and Luke jumps and right, grabs right. it and starts to fight everybody. And so that's what you get. So it's the kind of thing where like, if you have both sets, <laughs> then you can maybe set it up to look <laughs> like the scene from the movie. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting combo. Uh, actually, you know what? Um, Boba Fett is in that, is a, one of the minifigs. <laughs> Which oh, is, really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the minifigs are Han Solo in a white t-shirt after being frozen in carbonite. His eyes are closed. Actually, that's pretty funny. Uh, Chewbacca, Lando with the funny like face mask thing that he has on, Luke Skywalker with his lightsaber, and then Boba Fett with the jetpack. <laughs> those are <laughs> those are the many things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Anyway, that's my pick. Uh, worth looking at and maybe watching someone put together on YouTube, but I don't think it's going to be hitting my shelf anytime soon. What's your pick yeah. this week? Uh, my pick stays on theme with Arcane a little bit uh, because. It's it's not exactly a new documentary. It came out, um, I forget the date on it. It was either before or during Arcane Season 1, but it's called Arcane Bridging the Rift. It's an Arcane, the making of Arcane documentary on YouTube. It's in five parts, and it's pretty easy to watch. I mean, each episode is between like 23 and 35-ish minutes, so easy to just kind of pick through one of them at a time. But they cover so much stuff in that, just from animation music sound the casting and just the sound engineering part was pretty interesting as well because they t they talk about without giving too much away just how the dialogue in the scene was perfect the setting was perfect everything about it was perfect but it felt like it was just not what it should be and then um the sound team realized that it was in a big room and they, they sort of put this echo effect on it and, and just tweaked it to make it sound like it was the dialogue being delivered matched the space it was in. And then the, the creator of the show is like, yep. And that was it. That's all it needed. It's just, they get into that level of discussion and detail. It's uh, if you're enjoying arcane and I would, I would recommend giving it a watch. It's pretty cool behind the scenes. 
On your recommendation, I started watching it. I haven't finished it yet, but I have watched the first two. And it was really interesting to see, despite the size of Riot Games and the popularity of League of Legends, how much convincing needed to happen before the show would get off mm. the ground and how it yeah. was floundering, like, and how they, they couldn't quite get it right. And to no surprise, like the people in house that were trying to write it were not writers. They were fans of the characters and they wanted to do something good, but they didn't have the writing experience. And so they did something really smart and they hired Hollywood writers and consultants to come in and not necessarily write it for them, but like show them how to do it. And uh, I'm at that stage in, I think I've watched two episodes. And so they brought in a producer and they brought in a writer and all of a sudden things start to take off. Like, you know, the CEO mm -hmm. greenlits multiple seasons and now they're kind of off to the races. And it's not so much if they're going to be able to do it. It's now, okay, good. We're going to do it. How are we going to do it? Because it's a huge yeah. undertaking. And so that's going to be really interesting to watch. I, and, and it's very well done. It's a very well made and well shot documentary as well. And not overly dramatic. Like there's some dramatic moments, but it's not like drama for drama's sake, which I find some documentaries do. Especially ones on TV where they want to keep you around after the commercial yes, break or whatever. Yes, hundred percent. It's got great pacing. It's just, and you can see the passion in everyone. It's just, I don't know. It's 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 really good. If you're enjoying Arcane, just I recommend it. It's it's amazing. It's, I love seeing people do what they're good at, and having it all come together to create something that is just stunning. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that Stephen and I talked about at thecitadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email us at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on social media. Subscribe for free on all of the major podcasting platforms. That includes YouTube. The RSS feed and show notes are available on our website, thecitadelcafe.com. And why not tell folks about the show? It's the easiest way to support us. Just tell friends about the podcast and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find links to everything I am up to online at joelduggan.com. That includes a link to my other podcast, all about Minecraft at the spawnchunks.com. Follow me on social media at Joel Duggan and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where right now I stream Tuesday through Saturday at 1 p.m. Atlantic. That's UTC minus four hours now that the time has changed in North America. I play Minecraft. I play Satisfactory, and I'm looking to expand into some other games as well, and also Lego whenever I get a chance. So come on by and check that out at twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan. You can find Stephen at Stephen ESC and all the social media that matters. And of course, next time here on the Citadel Cafe, when we talk about more arcane dude thanks so much for being here this was a lot of fun i can't wait to talk about more with you yeah my pleasure it's been a while and it was a it was a good show to come back to talk about you've been listening to the citadel cafe where we are fast easy and cheap but you can only pick two